May 26, 1941. Fifteen British Ferry Swordfish torpedo bombers chug through the storm-ravaged North Atlantic skies. Their crews grit their teeth as their faces are pummeled by heavy rain and howling wind. The aircraft's open cockpits, leaving them woefully exposed as they navigate through the thick, dark clouds. They're looking to intercept the Royal Navy's enemy number one, the infamous German battleship Bismarck, before she can reach safety in occupied France. She eluded every warship Britain has left in the region, but they didn't count on these old-fashioned fabric-covered biplanes. As the swordfish's crews strain their eyes to locate their target through the gloom, suddenly they make out the towering form of Bismarck emerging through the fog. They line up for their bombing run to do what no other aircraft could. The swordfish's story began in the early 1930s as a self-financed private venture by the Ferry Aviation Company. Having already carved out a reputation for itself as a successful designer and manufacturer specializing in naval aircraft such as the Flycatcher and the 3F, Ferry began work on a new medium-sized three-seat biplane for maritime use, which would combine the roles of aerial reconnaissance and torpedo bomber. Powered by a Bristol Pegasus 2M radial engine, they would call it the Torpedo Spotter Reconnaissance 1, or TSR-1. The prototype of this new aircraft took its maiden flight on March 21, 1933. The TSR-1 performed various test flights, including some with an Armstrong Siddeley Tiger engine instead of its usual Pegasus. But despite its promising performance, it crashed after just six months and was damaged beyond repair. However, by that time, the British Air Ministry had taken an interest in Ferry's innovative combination of different roles and issued specification S-1533, which called for a more advanced version of the torpedo spotter reconnaissance aircraft. Ferry responded with the TSR-2. The aircraft was carefully crafted to meet its operational requirements. Though its biplane configuration and fabric-covered airframe already looked somewhat old-fashioned compared to the sleek, all-metal monoplane designs now taking over, these features offered excellent low-speed handling characteristics. This was crucial for carrier landings and when dropping torpedoes, which required a stable platform flying at low altitudes and speeds. The fabric covering would also make it surprisingly resilient to battle damage. Cannon shells could pass through the fabric without detonating, and the aircraft could absorb significant punishment and still return home. The aircraft was designed to seat three crew members, a pilot, an observer, and a third man who could operate as both radio operator and rear gunner, though it would frequently carry just two men, with the observer replaced by an auxiliary fuel tank. While exposing the crew to the elements, the open cockpit provided excellent visibility, a vital attribute for reconnaissance and attack missions. One of the prototype's most innovative features was its folding wings. The wings could be folded back along the fuselage, significantly reducing the aircraft's footprint on crowded carrier decks. This allowed carriers to accommodate more aircraft, increasing their striking power. Meanwhile, it featured a more powerful version of the Bristol Pegasus engine used in the TSR-1. Though far from being the most powerful engine available, the Pegasus was known for its reliability. This was a valued quality for an aircraft expected to operate far from land over the open ocean. On April 17, 1934, the prototype of what would become the Swordfish took to the skies for the first time, signaling the beginning of a thorough testing process. In the following months, the aircraft would have a twin float undercarriage added, enabling it to land on the water. It then completed aircraft catapult and recovery tests on the battlecruiser HMS Repulse. During the testing phase, naval officials were impressed by the Swordfish's ability to carry a variety of payloads, including torpedoes, bombs, and depth charges. This earned the aircraft its nickname, String Bag, a reference to the string shopping bags popular at the time, which could carry contents of any shape. While its low top speed of just 143 miles per hour was a concern, especially given the rapid advancements in fighter aircraft technology, its stable flight characteristics at these low velocities made it an excellent platform for torpedo attacks. With testing complete by 1935, 
The Air Ministry saw enough potential in the Swordfish to place an order for three pre-production aircraft. These featured a three-bladed Barry Reed propeller instead of the prototype's two-bladed version. Sufficiently satisfied with the results, the Air Ministry offered Ferry a contract for 68 units in early 1936. In July that year, the first generation of Swordfish began service with the 825th Naval Air Squadron of the Fleet Air Arm, still part of the Royal Air Force at the time. The Swordfish gradually began replacing older reconnaissance aircraft like the Ferry Seal, as well as torpedo bombers such as the Blackburn Baffin. By the late 1930s, it was the Fleet Air Arm's only torpedo bomber. The outbreak of World War II in September 1939 thrust the Swordfish into active combat roles. While it saw little action in the first few months of the war, its first major engagement would come during the Norwegian campaign in April 1940 at the Second Battle of Narvik. On April 13th, as HMS Warspit steamed into the Narvik Fjord, a lone ferry swordfish catapulted from its deck on a mission to search for the elusive German destroyers known to be hiding in the fjord's nooks and crannies. Scanning the coastline as they soared over the icy waters, the crew located several enemy vessels. While choosing a target, they spotted something unexpected, the dark shape of German submarine U-64, brazenly anchored just 50 yards from shore in the Herjungsfjord. The swordfish pilot didn't hesitate. Banking hard, he lined up his attack run. The submarine's crew, caught off guard, scrambled to their stations. As the swordfish dove, 200-pound anti-submarine bombs dropped from its wings. The first bomb fell wide, but the second was a direct hit. Less than 30 seconds later, U-64 had slipped beneath the waves one last time, never to resurface. It was the first time in the war that an aircraft had sunk a U-boat. Meanwhile, as Warspit engaged the German destroyers, HMS Furious launched a strike force of 10 more swordfish, each armed with 250-pound bombs. However, this attack proved less successful. None of the bombs found their targets, and two of the swordfish were shot down by anti-aircraft fire, with one crew lost and another rescued. Nevertheless, the battle proved to be a resounding British victory, and it wouldn't be long before the swordfish would get another chance to prove itself. On November 11th, 1940, as the sun set, 21 ferry swordfish biplanes rose from the deck of HMS Illustrious, bound for the supposedly impregnable harbor of Taranto, where the battle fleet of the Italian Navy was anchored. Under the cover of darkness, the first wave of 12 aircraft approached the port. At precisely 10.58 p.m., the night sky erupted in a dazzling display as the lead swordfish dropped flares to illuminate the harbor, momentarily blinding Italian gunners. The rest of the group swooped in, skimming just above the waves as they prepared to wreak havoc with their torpedoes. The Italian defenses created a gauntlet of 101 anti-aircraft guns, 193 machine guns, and 87 barrage balloons. Yet the agile swordfish, benefiting from months of intensive night flying training, jinked and weaved through the storm of fire. The battleships Conte di Cavour and Littorio were both hit by torpedoes, while other swordfish carrying bombs struck cruisers and destroyers, leaving a trail of destruction in their wake. Ninety minutes later, a second wave of eight swordfish arrived, pressing home the attack just before midnight. More torpedoes slammed into Littorio, while another crippled the battleship Duilio, flooding her forward magazines. The Italians fought back ferociously, firing over 13,000 shells from land batteries and thousands more from ships. Yet the swordfish's small size and exceptional maneuverability proved a significant advantage. Of the 21 aircraft that participated, only two were shot down. Meanwhile, the might of the Italian fleet lay shattered. Three battleships were severely damaged, along with several destroyers and cruisers. The swordfish's raid on Taranto demonstrated that naval air power could single-handedly cripple an enemy armada. This lesson would not be lost on other nations, as the blueprint for Taranto would soon influence another infamous aerial assault, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. In May 1941, the battleship Bismarck, the most feared vessel in the ocean, sank the British battlecruiser HMS Hood, pride of the Royal Navy, in just six minutes. 
This prompted a desperate search to find and destroy the German ship before it could reach the safety of occupied France. The British sent several warships to intercept her, but it seemed none would be able to reach her in time. On May 24th, a swordfish squadron from aircraft carrier HMS Victorious located Bismarck and launched a torpedo attack, but the only one that found its target failed to cause major damage. By May 26th, the only vessel left with any chance of preventing her escape was HMS Ark Royal, which also carried swordfish. That night, the biplanes took to the skies, flying through driving rain and heavy anti-aircraft fire as they approached the imposing Bismarck. This time, two torpedoes hit the battleship. One hit the ship's rudder, jamming it and leaving the mighty battleship able only to steam in circles. This critical damage allowed other British ships to catch up and sink Bismarck the next day, exacting revenge for the sinking of Hood and redressing the balance of power in the Atlantic. The attack on Bismarck highlighted several of the swordfish's strengths. Its ability to operate in severe weather conditions when more modern aircraft were grounded proved crucial. Even the aircraft's slow speed, often seen as a weakness, actually made it difficult for Bismarck's anti-aircraft guns to track effectively. Once again, the combination of a capable aircraft and skilled, determined crews had achieved what seemed impossible. As the war progressed, the swordfish proved remarkably adaptable. New variants were developed to meet changing operational needs. The swordfish Mark II, introduced in 1943, featured a more powerful engine and metal lower wings, allowing it to carry rocket projectiles. The Mark III variant, also introduced in 1943, was equipped with a large centrometric radar, earning the Swordfish a new role as an anti-submarine aircraft, operating from escort carriers to protect Allied convoys. Its ability to carry depth charges and rockets, combined with its long endurance and stability at low speeds, made it well-suited for this task. By the war's end, Swordfish had sunk 22.5 U-boats and shared in the sinking of many more. Its contribution to defeating the U-boat menace was perhaps the Swordfish's most significant achievement, keeping the vital supply lines between North America and Britain open. The ferry Swordfish remained in frontline service until the end of World War II, even outlasting several aircraft designed to replace it. Its longevity was a testament to its versatility, reliability, and effectiveness. By the time production ended in 1944, 2,391 swordfish had been built, a remarkable figure for an aircraft considered obsolete at the start of the war. Yet, the swordfish was not just constant, it had proven extremely effective. Despite its outdated design, it ended up being responsible for sinking a greater tonnage of Axis shipping than any other Allied aircraft during World War II. Today, the swordfish's legacy lives on. Several examples have been preserved and can be seen in museums around the world. The Royal Navy Historic Flight maintains two airworthy swordfish, which regularly appear at air shows, allowing new generations to witness this remarkable aircraft in flight.